know whether you've had a chance to have those difficult conversations yet. Conversations with your family about death, about dying, and about your plans. If we're of the younger generation, then we're speaking to or listening to our parents and maybe their plans. And if we're of the more mature generation, then we're trying to get our spouses to hear, we're trying to get our children to hear what those plans are. All the while, are in our hearts, we're standing there going, la 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 la, I don't hear you, I can't hear you, because those conversations are just too painful. It's too painful to think of this world without our parents or our spouses or our children or our loved ones in it. So it's no wonder that Peter, when Jesus started to describe about his suffering and his death and resurrection. It's no wonder that Peter said, this must never happen to you. It's like saying, oh, mom, stop it. You're not going to ever die. Well, we know that at some times, everybody is going to pass. Poor Peter. Last week, he was a hero for having the right answer right off the bat. And this week, he's in league with Satan. One commentator said that Peter holds the world's record for the fastest change in spiritual status. From Peter the Rock, whose confession is the whole cornerstone of Christianity, to Peter the stumbling block, who refused to hear the truth, and that can cause others to fall. From the way, to in the way. Jesus scolds Peter because he is thinking like everyone else. He's thinking in the world's ways rather than using his faith-driven imagination to think like God might. Peter, like the other Jews of the day, would have learned the lessons in the Hebrew Bibles, particularly the lessons from the prophets like Isaiah, that the Messiah, the God's anointed one, would usher in an age of justice and peace, and that this regal ruler from David's line would unite all the tribes of Israel and improve the whole world for humanity. And he would be divine. He'd be the son of God. So in this region of Caesarea of Philippi, where the rest of the world worshipped pagan gods like Pan, and where other kings were anointed, Peter's declaration that Jesus is the Messiah, the very Son of God, was really significant. As a spokesperson for the disciples, he was acknowledging Jesus' divinity and ultimate power over other forces. But it's likely that Peter and the disciples thought that Jesus would come and overthrow the forces of Europe, of Rome in a manner that was similar to the great Jewish kings and military heroes, people like David and like Saul. So it would seem really incredulous when Jesus began to talk to them about suffering and being killed and resurrection. God forbid it. No way seems like an appropriate response for Peter, rather than, whew, oh good, I'm right on board with that. Sometimes we too are also guilty about thinking in the world's ways rather than using our faith-driven imagination and considering God's plans. Listen to these choices. Would you rather win the lottery or work hard and save a percentage of your income for a rainy day? Would you rather be served in a store or a restaurant or would you rather give good service? Would you think about your rights and your entitlements, or do you focus on your responsibilities to others? Would you prefer to be loved or to love? Get or give? Easy street or the hard way? Self-centered or Christ-centered? Winning, getting, entitlements, being served, this is the world's way of doing things. We don't really want to hear Jesus' message of suffering or his call on our life. He said, 
If any want to be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those that want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Jesus' plan involves hard work, <coughs> being responsible, loving people. It involves denying ourselves and spending our lives for others. What could that possibly look like? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German Lutheran pastor. His postgraduate studies here in New York, he witnessed extreme poverty and the ch church's failure to integrate two races of mankind. He learned to see things from below, from where sin actually meets grace. And he began to live the teachings of Christ. And he felt really compelled to share these with others. He urged the church to be involved in the needs of the world and not bury Christ in a load of religiosity, his words. He was an opponent to Nazism right from the very beginning and was one of the few voices that spoke for the church's resistance to Hitler and to the persecution of the Jews. Now he could have, because of his theological training, have spent the whole of World War II here in the United States. Union Theological Seminary would have been glad to have him as a professor. But he returned to Germany because he said, I will have no right to participate in the reconstruction of the Christian life in Germany after the war if I do not share in the trials of this time with my people. Eventually he was arrested. He was hung just 23 days before the end of the war, just two weeks before the U.S. liberated that particular concentration camp. His last words on his way to this hanging were these, this is the end, for me the beginning of life. Now Bonhoeffer is a clear example of someone who lived his life fully committed to Christian principles. But we are not all called to be martyrs. What does it look like then here in the US in these ordinary times to give ourselves away for others? When I asked my husband this question, he said, well, isn't that marriage? He's right, a good marriage is more than just a 50-50 operation in which each person does half the chores and half the cooking and half the planning and half the cleaning up. If couples get into that kind of score cut keeping, it becomes a calculation and competition for being loved. But if each part of the couple in the marriage is willing to give 110% for their mate, they'll eventually find great joy. But the trick is that being loved and that loving, not being loved, that's just a getting, that loving involves risk because we are going to give our heart away to another. So what happens if that marriage doesn't last? Look around and you can see the hurt of people with broken marriages and ask a widow or a widower what it feels like, what that grief and pain feels like. What happens if our spouse or our child or someone we really love gets sick? I tell you, I would rather be the sick person than watch someone I love suffer in illness. Giving ourselves away brings great joy because it is the best thing we can do, but it also ends up opening us up to suffering. Now, when we give, it's not a gift if that giving is forced, or if it's given grudgingly. There's a cute little comic strip called Zits in the Baltimore Sun. It's written by Jerry Scott and Jim Borgman. And this week, the mom asks the son, the teenage son, to set the table. And he does it, but the little thought bubble above his head shows him with arrows, burning at the stake, and his mom says, well, don't be a martyr about it, or thanks for not being a martyr about it. When Jesus t talks of self-denial, he's not suggesting we go out of our way to find misery or not take 
a tablet if we have a headache, or engage in self-mortification, or go around with sad attitudes about our contributions to life. He's asking us to move beyond our self-centeredness into Christ-centeredness living. He's asking us to find our true life. God made us to be compassionate. Dr. Henry Cloud is a Christian clinical psychologist who's written a book about happiness. And he tells the story of his daughter, Libby. He sent her out to school one day and asked her to keep her eyes open for someone who might need something that she had. He was trying to teach her about sharing. And so she, through the day, did that. And when they got together at the end of the day, he said, well, how did it go for you today? And she said, well, there was a girl in my class who didn't really have a lunch, and, and, and the teacher gave her a sandwich, but I gave her my cookie. And he's like, oh, yeah, she learned about sharing. And he's about to give her a big lecture on sharing and the compassion of Christ and all that theological stuff. And she looked at his eyes and she said, Dad, what is it? What is it in here? And she was talking about a warm feeling that she got inside of herself when she shared that cookie. Dr. Cloud says that God has wired us for compassion. When we freely give, our immune system is boosted, our blood pressure goes down, our heart rate goes down, our brain chemicals change. In fact, when we freely give, the pleasure centers of our brain light up, just as if we had eaten that cookie ourselves. God has made us to be compassionate, and Jesus teaches us that those who lose their life for my sake will find it. We are created with the ability to think beyond the world's values and use our faith-driven imagination towards a, building a community on God's values. This week, we have experienced both an earthquake and a hurricane. Has your imagination been shook up this week? Has those storms blown in any fresh ideas? Sometimes, events like these knock us off ba balance and cause us to evaluate our lives. So, are you living a full life? A life worth living is not found by accumulating all the toys that the world has to, to offer. The emblem for Christian living is not a crown, but a cross. If we are to find out who we are, to have a sense of self, then we need to feel part of a greater, something greater than ourselves. And this is where Jesus is leading, leading us. Those who lose our life... <coughs> For my sake, we'll find it. We started our story with Peter. He just wanted Christ to stop talking so morbidly. He didn't want to hear about those bad things that was going to happen to such a good person. He wanted to protect and comfort Jesus. But Jesus was having none of that. He needed Peter and the disciples to clearly see the truth that he would have to suffer, to die, and to be raised again. God's ways are different than human ways, but by following a path of other-centeredness, we will find our true life. We would be following the path towards being the people that God created us to be, towards resurrection and new life through suffering. Bonhoeffer called this way of life costly grace. Such grace, he said, is costly because it calls us to follow, but it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus. It's costly because it cost Jesus his whole life, but it's grace because it gives mankind the only true life. Taking up our cross and following Jesus is the way to life. Amen.